One of the things that I've not talked about in great detail that needs to be talked about is the Great Reset. And I don't like coming from a negative point of view, that's why. So I've been waiting and waiting and thinking, okay, we know what they're planning. We know that there's going to be total totalitarian control. And that's not good news. And the Antichrist will one day come, and that's not good news. So what is the good news, Lord? What can we do to prepare? And so that's what I've been waiting for, and I think I've got a clearer picture from the Lord. And coincidentally, I'd actually already preached about some of this uh, without even knowing that I'd given some of the dates, and they've come to pass. So let's take a look at Genesis first of all. We like to start with Scripture. Genesis 1, verse 14. On the fourth day of creation, this is what God said. Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So we know that the sun and the moon can be used to calculate days of the year, days of the month, and that's all. But the Bible says there's more to it. They are for signs and for seasons. This is not summer, winter, you know, summer, spring, winter, fall, all that. This is the Moedim. This is the appointed time of the Lord, the Kairos moment, the opportunity in which we have a window to act and to receive the blessings of God. So there was a sign in 2017 which we called the Great American Solar Eclipse. It was the first total solar eclipse crossing the United States uh, in like 100 years. And it crossed on, the, on August 21st, 2017. In fact, I was right there in Houston, Texas, speaking about how a solar eclipse is often a bad omen, a bad sign for the Gentile nations. And lunar eclipses are generally linked to what happens in Israel. So I said, this looks like a bad sign in 2017. And I stood right where I stood and I said that only days later, the greatest hurricane, the most costly hurricane, went through Texas. And the place where I was standing to preach was no longer usable. It was flooded. So people couldn't attend church in that venue. Then I said, look, there's going to be a second total solar eclipse crossing the United States seven years later. And it will come on a particular date, April 8th, 2024. And that happens to be, on God's calendar, Nisan 1, in the year 5784. That is the religious new year. That is the Exodus calendar. And we've been talking about the Exodus and how it's a template for the end time. The Exodus is the most referred to event in the Bible. It is the template of redemption. It is the template of how we get out of slavery into freedom. In every level of meaning, whether you're talking about sin, personal conflict, financial debt, this is the template. And there's going to be a solar eclipse marking this in the year 2024. And not only is this separated by seven years, but the crisscrossing makes an X or a cross over the United States. And I said back then in 2017, I said, I wish it were a good sign, but it looks like an omen. It looks like a bad sign for the United States that unless they repent of killing 60 million babies, Here's a nation whose lifestyle is killing babies with no remorse, no regret, no repentance, and has been going on for too long. And the atheism and the secularism and the affront and the blasphemy against God's name has gone on too long, and this is not good. Even though I love America, even though I think it's the greatest nation, the greatest Christian nation, has sent out the greatest amount of missionaries into the world, yet Americans have to wake up. I said this back in 2017. Now, I remember all that, but I said one more thing, which I forgot about. I said that in between these two events, the middle point happens to be three years, three months, three weeks, and three days away from each other. So the middle point is December 4th, 2020. But I set this date and I just forgot about it because we got so busy at that time and we've kind of moved on. But I need to come back to this and I'm glad that this is going to be the first video on the Frank platform. 
Let's take a look at the timeline. I like timeline. I love preaching about end time. Let's take a look at this. So the first eclipse happened on August 21st, 2017. Then the next one that is yet to come is April 8th, 2024. Another solar eclipse. And do you know this? There was one solar eclipse in the year 2020. And it happened almost at the exact midpoint. God is trying to get the attention of Americans. On December 14, 2020, so that's really at the end of 2020 and, near, and just at the beginning, nearly the beginning of 2021, there was a solar eclipse that's come and gone. Again, separating those two, it are roughly three years, three months, three weeks, three days. So let's take a look, rewind the clock, what happened. Seems like history now, but November 3rd was election day. And people think that that's, you know, that's the day that it's decided, but it wasn't. It's actually the day that voters vote for the electoral college electors to represent them, but not for the presidential candidate himself. So it was not the end, but just the beginning of a political process. Next important date was December 8. This is called the safe harbor date. What does this mean? The safe harbor date is the deadline for states to certify their results, compelling Congress to accept those results. December 11. This was very important. December 11. The Supreme Court of the United States rejected a lawsuit brought by Texas Brought, brought by the Texas Attorney General and also signed by the Attorney General of 17 other states. And these four states, which were the battlegrounds, were Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. December 14 came, and the Electoral College formally cast their votes. During a total solar eclipse, the only total solar eclipse of that year, smack in the middle of the two crisscrossing solar eclipses, which we call the Great American Solar Eclipse. It happens to cross America, and it happens to make an X mark on the continent of America. On December 18, the House of Representatives voted to impeach Trump for a second time. It was such a disgrace what they did. That, of course, failed. So on January 6, Congress accepted the vote, and there were some pre peaceful protests, but also some people who broke through the line in uh, the Capitol building. They actually did not break through, because if you look on the videos, they actually were allowed in by the police. And a lot of strange things ha happened that day. It would be no exaggeration for me to call December 14 the death of American democracy. The world watch as Washington, D.C. was surrounded by walls, and how ironic, because the Democrats said they would not fund a wall to protect America's border. And yet, a wall was erected to protect the politicians of Washington, D.C. How hypocritical was that? And we watched that, and to me, it reminded me of the Red Square, that kind of restriction, that kind of barricade. The people were not allowed into the people's house. Soon after Biden came into office, you saw the stark contrast. In Trump's America, Soleimani, the number one terrorist, the Iranian general, was eliminated. In Trump's America, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, they were hunted down and killed. But in Biden's America, you know who's so offensive? Dr. Seuss. They won't allow your children to read Dr. Seuss anymore. Mr. Potato can no longer be Mr. Potato because gender designations of, of male, female, they're all offensive in Biden's America. It's leftist lunacy. So you can't call Mr. and Mrs. You're not supposed to call father and mother. Your biological parents are supposed to be parent number one, parent number two. 
And this just happened hours ago. The Democrats have already kicked off the push to pack the Supreme Court with four new justices. They want to pack the Supreme Court and raise the number of justices from nine to 13. Now, strangely, I have to say, when the Democrats said the Supreme Court is broken, I really hate to agree with them, but this time, I have to agree. I have to agree. Even though their motive is not about justice, their motive is not about um, fairness, this is just a power grab. This is just them trying to amass power to the Democrats. And yet I believe that they're right in this case because when SCOTUS or the Supreme Court refused to hear a constitutional matter brought forth about the election results in four states, I do believe that the Supreme Court failed to do its job. So you now have this turmoil going on in America. You have many policies that are being pushed through very quickly that are clearly anti-Christ, anti-Christian, anti-church, anti-Bible. But America's problems are just beginning. And the eclipses warn you, warn Americans of this, that you need to get serious about your faith. You need to pray in a different way. You cannot let evil overtake the nation. But it's more than what's going on in America. Europe is planning a great reset. If I can name or rename the American eclipse, I would call it now the American Reset Eclipse. America has many enemies in the world, and the way that they're waging war against America is what's called currency war. They don't have to send their boys to fight in America. They can wage war economically. And this is what's happening. The Europeans have already declared that they want a global reset. The World Economic Forum, Davos, whatever you want to call it, the leaders of Europe and the world have gathered together and said, we don't want things the way they are. Now, how is America a superpower right now? Through the U.S. petrodollar. Commodities like the petrol uh, and oil and gas are denominated in U.S. dollar. And so it is the world reserve currency. Everybody needs some of it in order to transact and buy important commodities. Now, many nations have said, we're fed up with this system. This allows America an advantage. This allows Americans to have a consumer economy and not a producing economy because their dollar is artificially propped up. So when they say the Great Reset, what they're saying is they want to reset the currency. They want to change the currency. So under the guise of coronavirus, of COVID-19, they have pushed through a lot of things that maybe we're unaware of. But one of the things certainly is that Europe is going full steam ahead with the Great Reset. They want to replace the U.S. dollar with something. Now this is the question, what is it? And since we know that digital currency is coming, we should be prepared. Since we know the mark of the beast has something to do with the ability to buy and sell with a particular mark, we prophecy students and we prophecy followers should be the most prepared. And yet I find that we're, we're not. We don't, we don't have any plan. I think we should. Here's uh, Klaus Schwab's, the head of the Great Reset Plan. He says that we need to reimagine capitalism. Now, capitalism is the system of free market trade which has lifted half the world out of poverty in the greatest, fastest period of time. And he says we have to reimagine this. They say, quote, the COVID-19 pandemic has provided a unique opportunity to think about the kind of future we want. Time, this is Time Magazine, partnered with the World Economic Forum to ask leading thinkers to share ideas for how to transform the way we live and work. So while America's foes are planning for the demise of the U.S. dollar, what does the Biden administration do? They print money like crazy. They come up with stimulus packages, which they call coronavirus stimulus, which have only 1% 
of the budget allocated to coronavirus. And 99% is what? It's absolute corruption. They're transferring wealth to their own pockets. And the news is that the head, the, the co-founder of Black Lives Matter, has enriched herself on this supposed nonprofit agenda of helping black lives. And yet she has amassed four properties, all in predominantly white suburbs. Now, how many other black lives can live that way, own that much? So the head of a nonprofit organization amassed this wealth, and you're not allowed to talk about it. Did you know that Facebook has prohibited, has banned any talk of this? If it doesn't fit the narrative, you will not hear about it. This is why we need something like Mike Lindell's platform, Frank. And I'm sure others are working on other things, but right now this one is up. So I think it's okay. Let's support it. This is parody, but it says, Camera catches looters stealing trillions. You want to talk about theft? Nothing greater than, than legal theft passed by the politicians. Printing trillions of dollars when you're in debt is nothing but theft of future generations' wealth. It is a disguised form of tax, but it's happening right in front of your eyes, and very few people are realizing, with Europe planning for a global reset in currency, with America, Biden's America, printing trillions, what you're going to have is a failed U.S. dollar. You're going to have the U.S. dollar burn up, inflated, and worth less and less. But the problem is not over. You also have China. This week, China has announced that it wants to have a central digital bank currency. They call this CDBD. CDBD, a central digital bank currency. Meanwhile, America's completely asleep about it. They don't even know how to regulate cryptocurrency. They're having a fight with Ripples, the company that owns uh, XRP, and it creates a lot of instability and uncertainty. Australia, unfortunately, also is in the same boat. We've taken this hostile posture towards cryptocurrency, and so the CEOs, a lot of the crypto innovations are actually native to us. We have several companies that started business and started coding cryptos here locally. And you know what's happening this month? They're fleeing. They're going to the UK. They're going to Europe. They're going to anywhere else where the laws are clear and friendly. So we're shooting ourselves in the foot. We don't have a strong economy. We don't have immigration. Where's, where, how is the engine of the economy going to be revived? Meanwhile, we've got this brain drain happening, which, thank God, one of our senators has actually put a, an article out in one of our major newspapers and says, if we don't change our posture towards cryptocurrency, we're going to have a brain drain in this country. Because the smartest people in the world don't want to be uh, pressured and harassed by constant, vague compliance requirements. You need to be clear. Are you for it or against it? Do we want Australians to prosper in this, or do we want Australians to be out of the game in this kind of innovation? America's out of it. Right now, Australia is kind of on the edge. Meanwhile, Europe and China are leading the way. They're grabbing hold of this technology as a solution to many banking problems with, with both hands. They're ready to embrace this, and they think that it's the solution, but they want the control. So it's a, it's a real dichotomy right now. It's a real dilemma, because on the one hand, blockchain could be decentralization, of currency, and then you don't have the government just printing, printing, printing as they want to. And yet, the governments are trying to take hold of the blockchain and centralize the blockchain, which defeats the purpose. It's a war right now. All the war is focused on currency. And if Christians don't understand this, Revelation 13 told us ahead of time, get ready for this. The last war is going to be about currency. 
And the Antichrist will at some point gain control of the currency for a brief moment of time. It doesn't mean that he runs everything. It doesn't mean that you now just say, oh, well, I, I'm going to withdraw from the economy. That's not what the Bible says at all. All the way to Revelation 18, you see that people are buying and selling until the day Jesus comes. Jesus said they will be marrying and giving in marriage. They will be buying and selling all the way till I come. So there's not going to be a, a destruction of the economy, but there's going to be a massive shift. There's going to be a transition from fiat to digital. And it's happening right now. Now, if you're following my ministry, you should be prepared. You should be the mo most prepared. And if you don't want to be prepared, then fine. Then you leave Europe and China to prepare. China now, this week, proposes global rules for central bank digital currencies. It's too, it's too late to turn back the clock. There's no going back. They are planning a change from fiat to digital. But if you're not praying about it, if you're not involved in it, and China gets a hold of this, you know what they're going to do? China's already proposed one of the rules. Of course, digital currency is going to be control, right? It's control of your transactions. It's absolute surveillance of everything that you own and do with money. But it's more than that. China has proposed, did you know, that when they have their own digital yuan, if you don't spend it, they say their money will have an expiry date. So there goes your idea of saving. They will force you to spend in order to kickstart the economy. They'll do anything possible to save themselves. So not only is your uh, money going to be worthless, it's going to go digital, and then they're going to track you, and then if you don't spend it, they'll evaporate it. Does this sound like the Antichrist? Sure. Communism has always been the spirit of Antichrist. But if you live through communism and you say, well, I give up, I'm not going to participate, you wouldn't see the victory that the prayers of the saints had over the Soviet Union. The Iron Curtain fell down. I don't think China has the last word on this. I think that there are good days ahead for the saints, but we've got to change our strategy and we've got to change our prayers. We've got to prepare ourselves. I think we should. I can't speak for you. Now let's go to the big talk of the town, Bitcoin. I spoke about this since 2017. And back then, some people bought because they heard about it, they understood what the blockchain was, and then the Chicago uh, Mercantile Exchange came in, CME. And what they did was they crashed the Bitcoin price because they started trading futures on Bitcoin. Now, if you don't understand what this means, is they trade derivatives off of the actual thing. So the, the attraction of Bitcoin is that it is in limited supply. In the end, there will only be 21 million Bitcoins mined. Right now in circulation, there are 18 million so far. So we're getting near the end of the mining of the Bitcoin. Many people have lost their Bitcoins, forgotten their keys, forgotten their wallet, passwords, things like that. So there are certainly less than 18 million, and there's not going to be any more than 21 million. So that's the value of Bitcoin. So that means that you've got something finite that a lot of people want, so that drives the price only one way. It has to go up. But when these Wall Street type guys come in, they create sub-products called derivatives. Remember, derivatives is what crashed the real estate market in uh, 2008 for Americans. It's the derivative market that messes up with, you know, messes the free market. So they started making futures on Bitcoin in a greater quantity than Bitcoin actually existed. So they can actually short more Bitcoins than there are Bitcoins. So it drove the price down, it crashed it. So at that time, if you cashed out, you'd be very sad, very sad. But I can tell you, I know a lot of Christians who did not cash out. You know that these things go in cycles. For Bitcoin, it's a four-year cycle. So they didn't cash out, and then it went from the highest, even if you bought at the absolute peak, 
in 2017, the peak was 19,000 US dollars. Fast forward to January 2021, and it hit $34,000. Today, it's over 60,000 US dollars. That's over 80 Australian, 80,000 Australian dollars. So if you didn't sell, you did very, very well. Because the core principle of Bitcoin, the, the core uh, reason for its existence is still intact. It is still there. Now, can it go to zero? Can the banks declare it illegal? Yeah, sure, okay. But when it, it's declared illegal in one country, people flee to another. And when it, currencies crash, like in Venezuela and Zimbabwe, they're going to Bitcoin. So that's where we're at. Now, I'm not saying at this point, go buy Bitcoin. I'm not saying that. You need to understand that. I'm giving uh, prophetic teaching. I'm not giving financial advice. But I think that our responsibility as Bible teachers and as pastors is to help you live your Christian life out in whatever context that you're living in. And we're living in this context right now. Now, what's going to happen? We don't know for sure, right? But history is usually uh, what we go by. And the history of Bitcoin so far shows that there are four-year cycles because it's the mining. There's, uh, the amount of Bitcoins that can be mined goes, um, reduces by half every four years. So because of that, intrinsically, it creates a four-year cycle. And since it's the leader, then all the other cryptocurrencies tend to follow that. Does that make sense? Let me just show you this graph. So every time there's the four-year halving, then Bitcoin is at a low and it begins to climb parabolically. And I, I see that if history holds the pattern, then I see this is now the beginning of another parabolic move. So it's an interesting thing because I teach prophecy, I teach end time, and I know that the Lord said this in Proverbs 13, verse 22. He said, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is being stored up for the righteous. Now, this is exactly the Exodus pattern. The Jews were slaves, so it looks like it's really bad. They own nothing, and the Egyptians own everything. But remember the pattern. The wealth was stored up by the sinners for the righteous. So at the moment of the Exodus, they took all that wealth which they helped create in Egypt. So the, even the slavery had a purpose because it created the wealth of the Egyptians, and then when they left, they took that wealth. But God specifically earmarked that wealth and said, it is for the building of my Mishkan, which is Hebrew for my dwelling place. Every generation has an opportunity to build a dwelling place for God. And you see, there wasn't just a tabernacle, then there was a tent that David built, then there was also the temple of Solomon, then there was a temple of Ezra, and then there was the temple of Herod. So you can see that God wants to build something. And now, of course, we build churches. These are the embassies of God on the earth. So the Bible says that the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. So I think it would be good if we knew how it's being stored and how could it transfer to the righteous. So the qualification is only one, that you are righteous. Righteous means that you've had your sins forgiven by Jesus Christ and you know what to do with life. You're not going to spend it on yourself. You're not going to waste it on drugs and booze. You're going to do something good for God. You're going to pursue God's plan. If you're one of the righteous, then the Bible already says, wealth is going to come to you at the right time for His plans. The Bible does say in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty. That means arrogant. Just because you make a little money, don't think you're better than other people. Nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, and storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come. So the Bible says not everybody handles wealth very well. Some people have a bad relationship with money. And if money is going to preoccupy you, then you should not pursue it at all. But the Bible says here that there are people 
who are wealthy. And God ordained that they use their wealth to give, to share, to fund missions, to build church projects. They are called. And it's these people that really should find out what's going on with this great reset. I also want to warn many Christians who think that you can make a quick buck from all of this, that I have been preaching and studying about this since 2017. I'm not the earliest. In fact, I kind of kicked myself because I heard about it before. The first time I heard about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency was on a, a tour of Israel. I lead tours to Israel every year. Um, we couldn't do it last year because of COVID. We're planning to take a tour, uh, a Christian tour, to Saudi Arabia this year. We're waiting for the lockdown to be uh, over in our country. But um, the first time I heard about it was in Israel. And I didn't pay attention. Obviously, I'm the tour guide. I'm the tour leader. It's very difficult to listen to everything. But I heard about it. I didn't, I didn't get in. I mean, back then, my goodness, Bitcoin would have been maybe at most $1,000. It's $80,000 today. Right? So God brings you opportunities. You can't catch every one of them. That's life. That's life. And because my main pursuit is not money, then I say, okay, it's a, it's a gone, it's a lost opportunity, but there'll be more. So I started talking about in 2017, realizing, hey, there's a great shift coming. And I tell you something. I have learned that there are a lot of scams out there. If you think you're going to make money quick, you got a huge learning curve. There were scam miners we met, scam staking, scam wallets, wallets you put into and they, they don't let it release or charge exorbitant fees, scam exchanges that have disappeared. So there's a lot of mines that you're going to have to avoid. Uh, no pun intended. A lot of mines you're going to have to avoid in this space. By the way, this picture here is the front cover of my book, Scam Proof Your Christian Life. And it tells you the natural and the, the spiritual principles to avoid scams, but also to get restoration. So we had somebody that was scammed of nearly $300,000. And by applying this, the principles of this book and the scriptures here, they got their money back. It was a miracle. It was an absolute miracle. So... I'm not saying very lightly, okay, that uh, we talk about crypto and things like that, and Christians, uh, I'm not saying Christians ought to just jump in. Some people cannot handle it. They do not have a calling. They do not have the interest. Don't touch it. It's okay. It's okay. I won't talk about crypto the next time. I won't talk about crypto all the time. But sometime, you allow me just to touch on a very, very hot topic in the world right now. Would you agree? Yeah. Now, for people who follow end-time teaching, they often think that if I believe that Jesus is coming soon, which I do, then that means that we should sit on our hands and do nothing. I explained this in a tweet recently, and I said, I'm a Bible prophecy teacher, and I have to prepare people to live as though they will go through the Great Reset and build churches for decades and generations to come. But I also have to prepare people to be ready for the rapture at any time. It's no different from being a pastor. My job is to prepare people for life and to prepare people for death. I treat uh, prophecy no different than pastoring. My pastoral work is to mostly prepare you to live, but I also have to prepare you to die. They're not a contradiction. Jesus could come back any time, very soon. And yet, you're to raise your family, you're to send your children to school, and you're to continue making a living and serving God, as if you're building for generations to come. This is not a contradiction, but this is the kind of tension that we have to live with, and we depend on the Holy Spirit to tell us which season we're in. So we flow with Him. If you understand prophecy, really you should understand this. Earth is destined to be greater than heaven. Why do I say so? Number one, the Messiah, our Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, 
Jesus Christ, will move his headquarters over here. The capital of the world and the capital of the universe will be Jerusalem, which is on earth. The rich and the powerful do not move to a poorer or worse place. Two, God the Father will move here. And three, the redeemed are a higher order of being than the created. So because earth has a great destiny, earth is destined to be greater than heaven. God's going to leave heaven to live on earth. We, the redeemed, are going to be here on earth ruling and reigning the whole universe with him. The created don't get to rule, only the redeemed get to rule. So that's why the battle is on the earth. So when you, are, when you follow end-time prophecy and you think that means pack your bag, get out of here, the world's a huge mess, I could care less what happens to the world, why is he talking about Donald Trump, why is he talking about elections, earth is just going to be destroyed. No, earth is destined to be greater than heaven. So we care a lot about our life on earth. And we care a lot about what happens to the earth. So when you truly understand end-time prophecy, you change your thinking. Everything you do now matters for eternity. It's not like we just do nothing now, and when we get to eternity, oh, surprise, huge rewards. No. Probably a huge slap on the wrist, if not huge punishments. Because Jesus already warned that many Christians in the end time will say, I did nothing, I invested in nothing, I built nothing, I gave nothing, because I thought you were coming soon. What's the point of building anything? What's the point of doing anything on earth? I didn't even go to vote. A lot of American Christians like to brag about that. I don't vote. Well, you don't understand that you are told to occupy till I come, Jesus said. I think the scripture is now coming to pass. If you want to know the season we're in, we're in a prophetic season, we're moving towards the end time, Yes, many things are going to pave the way for the Antichrist, but the end is not yet. So the scripture, I remind you, says the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. How do you prepare for the Great Reset? How would you prepare? Obviously, you would want to be in faith. You would want to be in church, in faith. You need to surrender your life to Jesus, of course. But assuming that I'm speaking to born-again, spirit-filled Christians... How would you practically, naturally prepare if the world goes into turmoil, if the whole economic system is flipped on its head, if the U.S. dollar use, loses its dominant status, what would you do? Australia, where I'm speaking from, is very blessed. I'm going to give you an example from an accountant. This is not my example. This is from an accountant that I s spoke with recently. And she said her dad bought a home in Australia in the 1960s. Paid, back then, $10,000. $10,000 for a home. No such thing in Australia anymore. The median price of a home in Melbourne now is $1 million Australian dollars. So a $2 million church project is really a very modest project. $10,000 home in the 1960s today is worth $3 million. So her dad is sitting on, this accountant's dad is sitting on $3 million uh, locked in equity on that land. Okay, took 50 years to get there, but pretty good, wouldn't you say? Land is good. In the 1970s, the same man bought $10,000 of shares in a blue chip company in Australia called BHP. We're into mining. We're very blessed with coal and uranium. So that $10,000 share today is worth $10 million. So a lot of the people who study these things say, look, there's no argument here. You're never going to do any better than shares. Because here it is, $10,000 share. Okay, past performance is not indicative of future returns. Let me say that. Because people will think it's financial advice. It's not financial advice. It's the story of an accountant that I know. $10,000 of her dad's shares, after 40 years, became $10 million dollars. Would you like that? Why not? Why not? You say, okay, well, that's good because it's better that the wealth is with the righteous than with the sinners, as long as the righteous can handle it. 
you can't handle it, please don't go anywhere near it. Better to stay away from money because it will suck you in and you'll get scammed. But in 2021, if you had invested $10,000 in one cryptocurrency in January called Binance, you would be worth three months later $5 million. Three months later. Now that, I would say, has to be the best performing crypto of the year. Okay, so don't think it's going to happen to you with every crypto that you buy. But wouldn't you have liked to have known the information in January 2021? Because that's all it is, is information. Because you didn't know, you didn't get it. But somebody got it. Somebody in January 2021 put in $10,000, and three months later, it's worth $5 million. Something's changed. I'm not teaching you to pursue money and love money. I'm saying that if you have a purpose for money, if you know to build a mishkan for God, if you know how to serve God, there's a change. There's a huge transition. But with that comes a huge learning curve and a lot of landmines. Be very, very careful. Please don't invest anything that would make you lose sleep. And if it goes to zero, it can happen. You don't, you know, cry and and kill yourself. You don't want to do that over money. It's just money. Okay? Do you hear what I'm saying? Okay, you're still going like, where, how do I buy Binance? I hear your thoughts. Pastor, here's your thoughts. Binance is right now around 500 uh, U.S. dollars, or around 700 Aussie dollars. I don't know. I don't know if you want to chase something like that, but that was an opportunity. Somebody made this graph up. When you as Americans got the first stimulus check, it was $1,200. I saw the check. It had a big, you know, the big old Donald Trump signature on it. When you got that $1,200, if you did not go out and buy a new iWatch or iPhone, if you had just taken that money, $1,200, and invested it in Bitcoin, it would now be worth, and I think this is conservative because this graphic doesn't seem to reflect it, it would be worth $9,493. So $1,000, 200 becomes 9,000 plus in Bitcoin. If you invested it in Ethereum, it became 14,400. If you invested in ADA, you're like, what's ADA? This is the problem. How come Christians don't know? It's a coin called Cardano. If you had invested in Cardano, 1,200, free money, you got it free from the government, you just put it in. You're not going to cry over it because you didn't need it to begin with, right? Put it in, 1,200. Cardano would then return to you, by this moment, $44,800. Would $44,800 make a difference in your life? For most Christians, it would make a huge difference. But why didn't it happen to you? Why did it happen to all the teenagers and the millennials? I know one guy in Australia, one millennial, 18 years old, Trade crypto while he's gaming. He's bought his parents a home and he's bought himself a home, two homes, by the age of 18. Now again, I'm not saying to pursue that. If you don't like it, don't have it. If you don't want it, you won't have it anyway. But if you want it, learn. Be open. Pray. Ask God about it. I said, if you invest when the market is going up, you'll feel like a genius. If you invest the day before the market crashes, you'll feel like an idiot. (laughs) The fact is, your success depends on factors that are beyond your control. And thus, there is more to success than your hard work. There is an element of faith. There's an element of faith in God's goodness. See, if you're a Christian, you're righteous, your sins are washed away, and you believe God favors you, He puts His favor on your life, then you should believe that in this season, something really good, really big is going to happen to your life. That's all I'm saying. 
It can happen. It can happen much faster than you expect it. I also tweeted out a few days ago, if you get up to make money for yourself, you are subsisting. If you get up to enjoy yourself, you are existing. If you get up to bless God and bless other people, you have found freedom and the meaning of life. And many Christians are not focused on God's plan because they're subsisting or they're merely existing. Maybe they're comfortable for themselves, but they're not pursuing the meaning and the purpose of their life. Something greater than you just enjoying yourself. And I would say most of us in Australia would be existing because even the poorest among us would be very well off compared to the rest of the world. So as I said, um, I am not at all recommending Bitcoin. It may have gone up too high. It may be in a bull's trap, catching people, new people in, and it might go down. Of course, all of that can happen. I am happy to say that our church is, has always been avant-garde in this area. We've always been prophetic. As far as I know, we were the first church in Australia to accept cryptocurrency. We've accepted cryptocurrency since 20, at least 2018, maybe 2017. So another question was, if Discover Church is receiving offerings and tithes in crypto, do we receive all coins? Well, there are 2,000 coins, 2,000 cryptocurrencies. So we, don't, we could generate all the addresses, but we put the addresses at the bottom or in the description box of the YouTube uh, videos and also in the Frank videos. So you'll find the addresses. But if there's a missing address, like let's say you bought Binance at $1, you want to give some Binance, ooh, man, that's amazing. So we can generate a Binance address. I think we have it, actually. So there are many, many options and it's easy to generate such addresses. So just look for it in the description box. And I can tell you, not many Christians tithe their crypto. Not many Christians give. But that's okay. We've had giving, and we've had some very generous people give through crypto. And what's amazing about it is, is crypto is like giving into the future. It's like giving in faith. Because if you give something that's worth, let's say Binance, let's say you give something that's worth a dollar today, you just buy it today, you spend a dollar. There it is. Give it to the church. I gave one dollar. But you know, by faith, it's not going to be one dollar. In, in this case, in three months, it turned out to be 700 Australian dollars. Do you get credited for that giving? Sure you do. It's the only by faith giving I know. You know, people often say, give by faith. Cryptocurrency is truly giving by faith because you're giving into the future, knowing what's coming. Because a global reset will come, digital currency will come, there's no turning back. There's no turning back. It's going to happen. When, I don't know. That, I cannot tell you the timing. But when you give crypto, you're giving into the future, and you're credited now. And then the tax man favors you as well. Did you know that? This is why you need pastoring. Because if you give something now before it grew in value then you get taxed on less in the future. But if you sit on it all the way to the end and you cash out whatever amount you cash out, say it explodes to a huge amount, guess what? You're taxed on all of that. And then you say, oh, I'd like to give 10%. Yeah, but you give 10% after the huge tax. If you had given 10% now, it would have benefited God and yourself. There are just things like that that I've thought through over the years that I have never shared, never shared with anyone. And I know I'm probably the first pastor who said it. Am I the first pastor you heard that say all this? I'd like other pastors to know because I think we could have future crypto churches built completely on crypto. That would be amazing, wouldn't it? Maybe we'll be that one. Maybe people just, they're not sure and they're just going to wait and see. Well, you wait and see. I'm going to conclude and say this. Our focus is not on anyone but Jesus. And God has his own reset. The devil thinks he's going to reset everything so that he can win. But God is knowledgeable. God knows all of this. He has his own reset. I think that even though it looks very bad in America right now, the devil has overplayed his hand. The left, the radical left, the Democrats have overplayed their hand. 
and going to the point of packing the courts, which you knew they were going to do, but Biden just absolutely pretended like, oh, I don't know what my position would be. I don't know. But of course, as soon as he wins, they announce they're going to increase the number of justices from nine to, how many is it? Thirteen. Thirteen. I think they've overplayed their hands, and I think great Americans, great Christians are going to react. There's going to be a backlash. At least I hope they do. And I think Trump's going to come back. Now, Mike Lindell called me. I had the honor to speak with him about his platform and, and be included as an influencer. But he told me personally that he believes Trump will come back this year. He says the evidence is so overwhelming. But no matter when it happens, I think God has his own reset. When everybody sees how antichrist, how bad the radical left have planned to take our nation down, I think Trump will be back. And 2024 has the, the third great reset eclipse. I think it's going to mark something. So it would be a perfect timing because that's the election year, 2024. Remember Proverbs 13, verse 22. If you believe it, then come and join Discover Church online. I want to give a shout out to my pillow. This is Mike Lindell's business, my pillow. He says, guaranteed the most comfortable pillow you'll ever own. And he sells more than pillows. If you go to his website, mypillow.com, there are pillows and bed sheets and all sorts of things there. They're a Christian business. They have been censored. They have been um, removed out of physical stores because of his stance on, on Trump and the election. So I think you can uh, be happy to support it. You can get up to 60% off. Depends on the products because they have their own offers like you know buy one, get one free and all that. But you will get a discount up to 60% if you put the promo code Pastor Steve. Oh, you didn't know that was coming. Pastor Steve, yes, I got the official word. Pastor Steve... Uh, Promo code for my pillow, and you know he's not only going to do my pillow; he's going to challenge Amazon. He's going to come up with my store. Oh, I can't wait for that. My store. I'm fed up with the censorship. I'm fed up with it. I'm fed up with the fact that Amazon actually took the server of Parlor down so that people could not communicate. We had to all go back and depend on Facebook, Twitter, Google. They're trying to control our thoughts and our speech. It's too much. So Mike Lindell is doing something good. We support it. We support Frank. His motto uh, is where free speech lives. And I want to close with a parting thought. Having heard all about the Great Reset, you may or may not be interested in the digital part, the financial part. It doesn't matter to me. God's going to do great things. Revival and Great Awakening is in store. But I would say this. Opportunity lasts only a little while. Opportunity lasts only a little while. And the Bible has a word for this. It's called kairos. Kairos is the opportune moment, the perfect timing, the ordained time. So I believe that you are very blessed to be in the ordained kairos moment of God.